G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Best Fiends a shout out for sponsoring this episode. And you know, when you finish binging the latest riveting podcast on your list, there's always one lingering question staring you in the face, right? Now what? Sure, you could surf the net and deep dive down the Wikipedia wormhole researching everything related to the show, but when your brain, or maybe even your browser tabs, are full to the brim, it might be time to take a break from it all and change the pace. And this is when I like to kick back and clear a few levels on Best Fiends. I really enjoyed some of the levels and puzzles of late, especially some of the boss levels, and I've actually been playing it over the holidays after feasting on way too much food and just being in need of desperate digestion time. It's been a great way to kick back and have some chill time. And I think that's what I love about Best Fiends the most. It's a fantastic boredom quencher, but also is great for casual gameplay in moments of downtime throughout the day. I also love that more levels, events, challenges are always being added too, so the game never runs out of things to do. The game is also free to download, and with over 100 million downloads, this 5 star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. So, download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. It was 1994 and I was a freshman in high school. My family had just relocated to Michigan and we moved into a private golf course in a small town outside of Detroit. But for some reason too, I really, really wanted to get a job at the time and the restaurant in the neighborhood clubhouse was hiring dishwashers. Since it was pretty much a stone throw away from our house, my parents okayed me to be able to work in the later evenings after school. So a little bit about teenager me. I was a super sensitive kid and my feelings were easily hurt if I was talked down to. I was also a rule follower and extremely submissive to authority figures, which apparently made me an easy kid to raise, according to my parents. But anyway, given that this was my first job ever, while having no confidence and paper thin skin as well, I was destined not to last very long under the high pressure of the restaurant industry. I was doomed to fail in other words, but I still went for it. And sure enough, the chaotic pace of working in a high-end kitchen quickly overwhelmed me and I found myself having a hard time keeping up. On top of that, my boss was an absolute tyrant. I basically felt habitually crushed as he'd scream at me to keep up during the dinner rush. I was as much of a mess on the inside as the mess I was trying to clean up. But the worst part about it was that after the restaurant would close, I would have to stay for like an hour or so alone with him to close up nobody around, just me and him. During this time, he would continue to yell at me and, at best, roll his eyes if I needed help. Even as sensitive as I was, I kind of knew that his rage wasn't a, a personal thing though. He was just a, a really disturbed individual by the looks of things. One night that I had off, I also caught an episode of the TV show America's Most Wanted. I don't know if it's still on, but Basically, they would do these segments, with extremely poor reenactments, mind you, of criminals that were on the run from the FBI. Sometimes they'd have real photos of the fugitives, but other times they would just have police sketches instead. During one of the segments, a sketch came up of a subject that eerily looked similar to my boss. They said that he had murdered several victims on the West Coast, and that's where he was last seen a while back. They also identified him with a different name, which kind of put me at ease for a moment. But the drawing looked a lot like him, and the description of his height, weight, and other attributes fit him to a T. Well, I convinced myself that it must have just been a lookalike, but I just had that weird twisting and turning in my gut that maybe, maybe it was actually him. I mean, I was about to quit anyway, so it didn't really matter, I guess. But the next day I went into work and he was a no-show. In fact, he ended up leaving town and no one ever heard from him again. In fact, he pretty much vanished like a David Copperfield magic trick. We didn't have internet at the time too, so there wasn't the opportunity to like immediately jump on social media to investigate. 
I don't remember reading anything in the newspaper, but the rumor of his disappearance definitely went around town. Unfortunately, or who knows, maybe fortunately, I also don't remember anything else about him. I can't recall his name or really even his face these days. Just the creepy and really odd experience. I mean, who knows if it actually was him or not. But to think that I may have been alone with an angry murderer as a teenager is a tad bit uneasy, to say the least. Anyway, if it was him, I'm very thankful that I got out of that one unscathed. So to start off, I would like to give a bit of context. This happened four years ago. I'm a girl, and at the time that this happened, I was 12 going on 13 in just a month or two. But the friend I mentioned in this story was 14 at the time as well. The friend, Sally, who I was staying with that night, 14, was quite a bit older than me. At least at the time, the two-year age gap was quite big. At 12 or 13 years old, I was about to start my second year of middle school, or whereas Sally should have been about to begin her sophomore year of high school. I met her in the beginning of my first year at a new school. She was older than the other kids in her grade and was considered one of the popular kids, and I think that that was what drew me to her at first. But we became fast friends, and before we knew it, we were spending pretty much every single weekend together. Seriously, like every single weekend. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary too. It was our typical Friday night, we carpooled to her family's apartment after school. I've always been a bit of a picky eater too, so when her family had dinner I didn't eat with them. I just snacked on the pop tart that I stowed away in my backpack in case they ordered something that I wouldn't eat. Something to note too is that her family was pretty religious. I wouldn't go as far as to say that they were fanatics or anything, but they didn't allow their kids to watch horror movies or anything that was rated PG-13 or older. It didn't stem from their desire to protect them from something inappropriate or anything. Sally's mother had an irrational fear that scary movies actually had satanic messages. Well, we asked to watch The Purge, and her mom obviously said no. After some negotiating though, she agreed to let us watch Hunger Games instead. Now, after the movie, Sally and I went to hang out in her room. She put on some music, and being the age that we were, we gave each other makeovers. By the end of it, we were looking much older than just 12 and 14, and this part of the night is when things started to seem off to me. You see, Sally wasn't the most positive influence. Despite being my best friend at the time, she was manipulative and got off on putting me down. She had a really bad habit of talking to men online and also lying about her age. Sally showed me some texts between her and this man that she was talking to. I can't give you the exact recount of them, obviously, but they consisted of him trying to convince her to meet up with him and just the usual things that you would expect from a creep online. According to him, he was 19, tall and blonde with soulful blue eyes. Once I saw the texts, I asked if she had a picture of him. Something just didn't sit right with me after seeing the messages. She showed me what he looked like, and he was very clearly not 19. This man was at least 40, and looked like he lived in his mother's basement. Then we got a call from him. Sally answered without hesitation, and when I heard the voice on the other end of the call, I felt like I was going to be sick. You're so pretty, why don't you come and meet me, he asked. Sally said that she couldn't because she was spending the night with a friend. And the mention of that seemed to spark his interest. He then proceeded to try and ask us both to meet him. Sally, lacking any common sense, said yes too. And thus begun her plan for us to sneak out and walk 15 blocks to meet him in a deserted McDonald's parking lot. Obviously, I really didn't want to go. I was raised on stories of what happens to teen girls who meet random men from the internet in person. But after adamant pleading from Sally that she didn't feel safe going by herself, I stupidly agreed. We took our phones with us for the walk. I had a kitchen knife stuffed in my bra in case something were to happen and I needed to defend myself. The route that we had to take to get there didn't have very many street lamps and there weren't any houses either. In fact, we were completely surrounded by trees on both sides of 
cars. We got to the parking lot though, the only car parked nearby was a black beat up 2000 Toyota Corolla. The car was still running when we got there too and from what we could tell there was more than one person inside. The man from the picture got out of the front passenger seat and left the door open behind him before approaching us. I turned my flash on so that I could see and he was obviously on something. I can't tell you what kind it was for the life of me, but his eyes were so wide that they looked like they were about to pop out of his head. He was jittery and kept twitching, and I became very conscious of how big he was. Maybe 6'2", around 280 pounds. For reference, my friend and I did not look our ages too, even without makeup. I'm about 5'2". My friend was pretty tall, probably around 5'6 or 5'7". And we were both significantly smaller than he was. Anyway, when the man got to us, he reached out for us and caught my friend by the arm. I went to get my knife out as quickly as I could and that's when I saw his friends getting out of the car. He invited us back to his car and offered us booze and drugs, but after seeing my knife and that I was ready to call the police, he released my friend. I took Sally's arm and ran faster than I ever had in my entire life. We took the long way home to avoid them finding out where she lived in case they were following us. Once we got there, her family was still sound asleep. We locked all the doors, closed the blinds, and blocked him on everything. There wouldn't be any sleeping that night. We were constantly peeking out the window and to our dismay, that same Toyota was circling around her apartment building. Not once, not twice, but three times. I never mentioned any of this to my parents out of fear of getting grounded or in trouble. I'm 16 now and they still have no clue. But I still get nervous when I see a car similar to the one from that night. As for Sally, her parents never found out either. We agreed to never speak about it again and thankfully... She moved into a new house just a few weeks after that happened. Safe to say too that now Sally and I haven't spoken in like three years. She was allegedly really angry at me for ruining her night and our friendship just didn't last for that long after that. We actually had a, a pretty bad falling out but looking back on it now it was definitely for the best. So I guess the moral of the story is... Don't sneak out at night, folks, and meet strange men in McDonald's parking lots. I used to sleep in a room that my grandfather used before he passed away. He moved into my house the last two years of his life because he was left alone after my grandmother passed away and needed help being taken care of. Before that, I slept in a garage converted to a room, but... But we ended up needing the space for storage. After my grandfather passed and his room was available, I moved into his room. When the bed shaking first started happening, I took my mattress off and flipped the bed over, thinking that maybe rodents had somehow got inside the mattress and I was feeling them run around inside of it. That's somewhat what it sounded like too. Just light but rapid tapping of the mattress at many different spots underneath me. I inspected every inch of the bed and mattress, but I never found anything, and nothing on the floor either. No trace of any animal or anything. But it would always start happening when I'd shut off the lights, and as soon as I sat up in bed, it would always stop. When I would lay back down, it would start up again after a minute or two, and it got to the point where it would wake me up after falling asleep. I ended up being very sleep deprived for as long as it lasted. This went on for about three months. And after the first month, I got rid of my mattress and bought a new one, but the problem persisted. Sometimes, out of frustration, I would slam my fist into the mattress in hopes that if there were mice or some type of a living creature that somehow had gotten into my mattress, that me hitting the bed very hard a few times would make it stop. But it never did. I would also place my hand between my body and the mattress to check and see if I was having some type of muscle spasms at different parts of my body, but there were no spasms. In fact, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was causing it. When I would sleep on the sofa in the living room, I didn't experience the issue. 
but the sofa just wasn't comfortable to sleep on and I would only sleep in there on occasion where I wasn't so exhausted from sleep deprivation that I was able to fall asleep while being uncomfortable. And then it got to the point where, well, I was afraid to go to sleep. I was a grown man who doesn't believe in the paranormal, but I was afraid for whatever reason. I guess it's because it's so bizarre and I just couldn't find an explanation after all that time spent trying to figure it out. At one point too, I went out of town with my brother and stayed with my aunt for the weekend, and it was really refreshing. The bed didn't shake and I slept really well. I even talked to my brother and told him the issues that I was having at home, but I never had any issues like what I was experiencing. It changed though from just an annoying occurrence into something that was scary after I stayed the weekend at my aunt's. You see, normally when I would sit up in bed, it would stop, but it changed all of a sudden to where it would keep going after I sat up and I could really feel the bed shake and hear the bed creaking as it shook. But below my bed was just empty space. The floor was about six inches below the bottom of the bed. And then one day it just stopped. I never felt anything out of the ordinary just after one random day that it just stopped. But for weeks after I was still afraid when I went to bed... This happened several years ago, and I still sleep in that same room. But I'm wondering if anyone has ever heard of anything like this happening to somebody else? I'm 100% certain that it wasn't my imagination too. I clearly felt it and heard it for a period of weeks, every single night, and I was wide awake when it happened, to the point where I was like getting out of bed and flipping the mattress and everything. But it's just so weird when I think about it. I took a very scientific approach to try and understand what the heck was happening, but in the end, I came out completely empty in finding any explanation. So, this is going to take a while to explain everything, but stay with me because it all comes around eventually. So my very first car was a dark green 2000 Volkswagen Jetta. It was the most basic of basics when it came to cars. No options whatsoever except for like an automatic transmission. It was $300, slow, dumpy, no right headlight, drove straight with the steering wheel practically sideways, let out a cloud of white smoke when it started. Every stereotype of a poor high schooler's car that you can think of. My car, it was no exception. Despite it being just a, a piece of German excrement, I loved that car. I drove it every chance that I had. I don't think a day went by that I didn't drive it, in fact. I named it Thunder Bunny. She was my baby. My beautiful green baby. But Volkswagens from that generation, Jettas especially, had a pretty bad flaw in the automatic transmission. I'm not sure exactly what causes it, but... Essentially, the transmissions gradually get worse and worse until the car will just not shift into third gear. And there's not really a thing that you can do from there, too. So, a couple of weeks after Halloween in 2019, I was going about 30 miles per hour when the engine just suddenly roared and the car wouldn't speed up. I feared the worst and my fears were justified, too. But my dad, a mechanic, didn't even have hope for my baby. She was gone already at this point. And so, much to my dismay, we started looking for a new car. It only took about a month for us to find her, a dark green 1999 Volkswagen Jetta, exactly like my old car, but absolutely everything. She was faster, had heated leather seats, auto windows, auto sunroof, everything that you could think of. All except for an automatic transmission. Now, I knew how to drive manual, so it was pretty much perfect, and I had a new baby from Crackhead Neighbor Girl. I loved that car even harder, named it Little Boy, and was so happy that I had another car again. So, I have a, a few more quick things to explain before I get to the main story, but it's important, not vital to the story, but still important. The first is for people that might not know, but when you have a manual car, you cannot leave it in gear and take your foot off the clutch. If you do, the car will stall, which is bad obviously. 
So if you do leave your car in gear, you need to turn the engine off before taking your foot off the clutch. If you don't want to turn the car off or have it turn itself off, you need to pull the handbrake or it will roll away. And you can guess what the only really broken thing on my car was at the point that this story takes place. If you guessed handbrake, yep, you're right. Anyway, now that I have that out of the way, now to the story. So, I started working as a pizza delivery driver in a smaller growing town in Michigan. It was good money, but every once in a while I delivered to an incredibly sketchy place, and have even had a few shotguns pulled on me. But one night, about, I would say two months ago, I was delivering on a Friday. Usually Fridays are very busy, but this day I was a little bit slow. So when a delivery came in at like 8.30, half an hour before we closed, I jumped on it. I realized that it was 7.1 miles away, so all the closing jobs, they would be done by the time that I got back and I would have been able to leave immediately. But it was way out of town in a sort of wooded, surrounded neighborhood. But again, no work when I got back to the store, right? Seemed like a good deal to me. And I'm all about those sorts of deals. So I climbed into my car and went to drive the 7.1 miles away. As I pulled up to the house, I began to just get a really bad feeling though. The house was a, a small trailer park type neighborhood next to a lake. The kind that the houses are all a good distance apart with a likely druggy problem. And it was completely dark. No lights inside, none outside, nothing. There was a single car in the driveway though and an open window on the side of the house. I pulled in behind the car in the driveway and just sort of sat there for a moment. I just couldn't shake this feeling that something was off about this place. Maybe it was the house being completely dark. I mean, there wasn't so much as a nightlight that I could see. Usually when I deliver to a dark house, there's at least a light on upstairs or something that would signal someone being awake, waiting for the pizza. But the house just seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put the car in gear, turned off the engine, grabbed the small, cheapest pizza that we had and got out. Without my headlights on, there was nothing. I could barely see the house, in fact. The only light was the dim moon at this point. I walked onto the porch and passed the big open window to the front door. As I reached the front door, though, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open, just enough for me to see into the void of the house. Thinking of every single horror movie that I'd ever seen, I said aloud, stuff this, and I hurried back to my car. I'm a tall, well-built looking guy, but despite my wide shoulders and baggy hoodie, I'm a bit of a frail thing and can hardly fight off a small dog. So I got into my car and turned on my engine. My headlights illuminated the house and almost simultaneously the living room light behind the big open window lit up and the single guy looked out and walked to the front door. I cussed to myself and weighed my options. If I went up to the door, I, I could die, right? If I noped out of there, then I would 110% be fine. That meant no new car part, no gas money, no cute dates with my girl, just sitting at home doing virtual schoolwork. I know, it was a stupid choice, but I grabbed the pizza and opened my door, making a choice that I'm glad that I made. I took the car out of gear and climbed out. But mostly so my engine would still be running, so that if I needed to, I could run back and immediately take off. I walked to the door where the man had opened it the rest of the way at this point. As I got closer, I also got a good look at him. Now, I'm not one to judge a person based on their physical appearance, but this guy's head was cleanly shaven and was covered in tattoos. He was wearing a pair of grey jeans and a white tank top. He had a scowl on his face that was staring me dead in the eyes. I looked past him for a moment into the house, which I then noticed was completely empty. As I got close enough that I started opening the pizza bag, he started to reach around his waist and I stopped. He was staring at me too with the most evil grin that I'd ever seen. And I knew in that moment that I was about to die. I had always heard your life seems to flash before your eyes. I, 
thought about my girl, that she wouldn't know what happened. My work would stop delivering upon my disappearance, assuming that my body wasn't ever found. My dad would regret telling me that he was happy for me landing this job. But man, someone was looking out for me that night because that was when I heard it. That distinct sound of gravel under tires. And I watched as my only pathetically small chance of escape was now rolling away. I didn't even look back at the car to know that. I just stared at the man and was about to say, man, screw this, when he looked back to my car and I heard the sound of the car rolling and it was getting closer. The guy's eyes went from the driveway to behind me and I finally looked over my shoulder and my car had rolled backwards and had come to a smooth stop near the mailbox of the house. I looked back at the guy who had a really nervous look now he looked back at me and scowled again and took his hand from his waist. He reached into his front pocket and took out $12 and handed it to me. I gave him the pizza and watched him slam the door shut. And at that, I ran back to my car and practically tore the door off trying to get in. I looked back at the house and the man was standing in the front window just staring out at me. You better believe though that I nearly spun the tires on my way out of there. I kept glancing at my mirrors until I started driving under streetlights, and it was easily the scariest moment that I've ever had. As soon as I got back to the store, I told my boss about it, and she called the police. We never did hear anything about it. I assumed that they went to the house, but probably only found a small cheese pizza. After this, though, I started carrying a knife on me at all times, and my boss is considering getting trackers for our pizza bags too. But you know what? It's only recently that I realized that this is sort of a bit of a butterfly effect story. But what I mean is that I, I thought it was the worst thing ever that my transmission went out, and I cursed my Volkswagen for designing such a terrible automatic transmission. But if that transmission was still working, then I would have still had that car when this happened. I would have put the car in park and it would have sat there while whatever would have happened, happened. I have zero doubts too in my mind that this man was planning on murdering me or something. And all I can say is, I thank God for terrible handbrakes. So, I've always been kind of creeped out by the house that me and my mum have lived in, but... It's gotten a little out of hand lately, I think. I always got that kind of feeling like, oh, someone's in the room with me right now, or someone is looking at me, and I would always check around to find nobody there, though. There are some pages posted around the halls. We rent an apartment in a house owned by someone else, with a bunch of writing on it that I and my mum could never figure out, and that added to the creepiness, I suppose... Either way though, my room has two windows, so there's lots of natural light. I used to have sheer curtains and pretty much keep them open constantly, until my parents came home one day and said that they saw someone outside of my window watching me. It was dark out. I'll tell you that story if anyone wants to hear it, but the neighbors here are terrible and always are messing with us, so I always just assumed that it was them being creepy, but now I'm... Not so sure. I hate being alone here though, even though I'm a huge introvert and alone time is awesome. I just always hear noises though that I can never figure out where they're coming from. There's always scratching in the walls, even though we've checked many times and there's no evidence of vermin. And recently things keep falling around the house too. I thought that maybe it was paranormal, but I'm even more scared that it's actually a real person. It just happened again, and that's what triggered me to share this, because currently I'm home alone, and I kept hearing noises around the house. As usual, I kept my door open, lights on in the main house, and cat on my bed. I kept getting up to check on what the noises were, in case of an intruder or anything, right? But there's nothing like normal. But then, I hear a really loud crash from the bathroom, another side of the house. I took a curtain rod for safety, a real useful right, and went to investigate and I didn't see anything suspicious. That is, until I looked up. 
You see, we have a drop tile ceiling, or whatever it's called, just in the bathroom for some reason. Nowhere else in the house, which is weird, but it's like those school ceilings. And one of the tiles was completely pulled out of place. I used my handy curtain rod to push it back into place, got my cat, he ran off to investigate the loud bathroom crash too, and a knife for security. I've already texted my mum, I don't want to say anything out loud, because if it is really a person then they might hear me, but it's not really possible for those tiles to support someone's body weight, but something definitely moved it out of place, and there was some loud noise that happened along with it. I don't know what the explanation could even be. Couldn't be the neighbors, there are floorboards between their floor and our ceiling. Unless they have some sort of a creepy crawl space to our apartment. Plus, I can hear them upstairs right now. They're stomping around and screaming at each other like usual. Whatever it is, I don't want to even know about it, but I think that I'm probably going to find out pretty soon. When I was a kid, about 12 to 13 years old or so, I wasn't in the best home situation, which meant that I spent a lot of time running away from home, hiding in my room, or walking the streets at night. But my home, outside of the terror of my parent, wasn't the safest either. It was a three-bedroom ranch, no larger than like 900 square feet, with front and side doors that no longer locked correctly. Even with the deadbolt, one good push and it would swing open. My brother and I, we often slept in the living room with a baseball bat, just in case someone tried to come in. And one night, while sleeping in the living room, our side door began to shake violently. At first I thought it was our parent coming in from the garage and I did my best to pretend to be asleep. Unlike my parent, who would have pushed the door open by now, the door was still closed despite the shaking. I tried to wake up my brother, but he wouldn't get up, so I ended up grabbing the bat and walked to the door myself. Since it was one of those kitchen doors with the window, I left the lights off and crouched to avoid being seen. I could see the gold doorknob being jerked back and pushed forward rapidly. It was never turned though, so I relaxed. It was probably a friend from down the street messing with us, I thought. So I peeked through the curtain to see who held the knob, but quickly noticed that the screen door over the main door was still closed, which meant the doorknob was sealed behind its latch. No one should have been able to grab it without at least cracking the screen door open. When I looked past the screen door, I noticed that there wasn't anyone there too. In disbelief, I opened the curtain door and looked all around the door, which was still shaking from the knob. I decided that this had to be someone messing with us too at this point. I mean, it had to be, right? I didn't know how or why, but it must have been. So I grabbed the doorknob with my free hand, but released it almost just as quickly because it was freezing to the touch, as if someone had stuck it in the freezer or something. Well, fed up and annoyed now, I turned on the porch light and swung open the curtain, ready to catch them in the act. But to my horror... There wasn't anyone there. Like I had suspected, the screen door was closed all the way, and the frame and bottom covered up the doorknob. There was no one hiding by the car on the other side of the house or ducking on the porch, but the knob was still shaking. Lost for words and thoroughly terrified at this point, I just conceded and turned back towards the living room. I had to wake up my brother. And as I was rushing back to him, I suddenly just heard silence. And there was nothing. The knob had stopped. I turned to look back, and in front of the door, inside of my kitchen, was a tall, pale man with dark, shaggy, wavy hair all of a sudden. Obviously, I was terrified. He must have been the one messing with the door, and now he was inside somehow because I failed to see him outside or something. I kept my eyes on him as I held up my bat and started yelling for my brother. The man didn't react though and took a couple of steps towards me. He seemed almost bored if that's the right word. His hands were in his pants pockets and his shoulders were slouched slightly. My brother was finally starting to stir and 
I was feeling like we were about to have the fight for our lives until the man tilted his head back, and it was just enough to clear some of his shaggy bangs from his face. But, and I can never forget this, where his eyes should have been, they were like two rotting sunken pits. Well, at that, I screamed like I had never screamed before. My brother sprang up from the sofa all of a sudden and immediately rushed to me, wondering what was wrong. I closed my eyes and dropped to my knees, covering my ears as he tried to comfort me. I don't know why I reacted like this, instead of telling him that there was an intruder in the house and to grab the bat, but the fear I felt was just so overwhelming that I couldn't control myself. When I finally did manage to tell him, he looked for the man, but told me that we were alone. There was no man. The door was still closed, and he told me that the knob felt like it always did. This was not the only time that I would ever encounter something like this, but this, this was the first time. And I just wanted to share this. So, thanks for listening. This happened about a month ago and it still comes up in conversation because we just genuinely don't know what happened or was about to happen to us. Uh, I'm sharing this story to hear your thoughts and ideas. So it was around 7pm in November. It was dark in Metro Detroit. I was driving and my fiance was riding passenger. We were exiting a pretty popular highway when we turned onto a mile road near the city shopping mall and outlet centers. Being in close proximity to the mall, it was sort of strange the boulevard was that empty at that time of night. But we're driving on this deserted westbound side of the boulevard when we noticed that there was a, a stopped running vehicle in the middle lane. Again, it was dark aside from the street lights that line the road every 80 yards or so, but their brake lights were obviously lit and we approached quickly. My fiancé and I were talking in the car at the time when we both kind of stopped to verbally question what we were both seeing. It was strange behaviour, especially since the speed limit is like 45 to 50 here on this mile road. In other words, you don't want to be stopped, especially this close to people exiting the highway. So we sort of slowed down since we're sort of cautious drivers. We approached and passed the vehicle in the far left lane as it was in the middle and when we were about maybe a car length in front of it, the driver just gunned it and started speeding to catch up to us. We never left our left-hand lane, but at this point, I was braking because, again, the behavior was really off and we noticed that driving was sporadic. But braking was almost instinctual as much as it probably wasn't safe to do so, but continuing to drive down this mile road, still no traffic in either direction that we could see, we noticed that the driver was swerving the car between the middle lane and the left lane as if trying to intentionally sideswipe us. It was an instant red flag, obviously, but it wasn't like the driver was intoxicated or texting and just doing a poor job to stay in their lane. This was a driver in control of their swerving and coming dangerously close to hitting the side of my Jeep, going like 45, which was obviously really dangerous. And before we knew it, we were blinded by a spotlight coming from the driver's window into my car via the passenger window. I have 20 tints on my Jeep windows, which usually helps control the brightness of the sun most mornings and evenings too. But even with the tints, this spotlight stunned us and we couldn't see anything but white. I didn't have time to check my mirrors before slamming on my brakes. Not sure I would have been able to see in my mirrors after being blinded like that anyway. But I remember my fiancé screaming, what the heck? But we opened our eyes though and the driver was yards ahead of us now, speeding to get away. I had my fiancé dial 911 immediately. I don't take this sort of rubbish though, so I started racing down the road to catch up to him for a license plate number. In Michigan, we have Michigan left turn lanes and I could see the vehicle up ahead turning into one to enter the mall parking lot, which is a huge roundabout. The roundabout speed limit is maybe about 25 with frequent stop signs and intersections. My fiancé connected with dispatch on the phone as I was trying to desperately catch up to this vehicle. They were blowing every red light and stop sign in sight. 
The dispatch recommended that we don't follow, but I kind of did anyways because I was really upset at this point and committed to grabbing their plate number, but from a safe distance and at a safe speed, obviously. No way was I going to tail this person when we didn't even know if they had a weapon or something. But, long story short, this driver knew that we were following them and they were speeding through the roundabout, cutting drivers off and blowing into sections when eventually we lost sight of them. At this point, the police said the cops in the area were already on their way looking for this vehicle that we described and that well, we should leave it to them. We weren't going to jeopardize our safety and the safety of other drivers just because I was annoyed, so we stopped our chase but still crossed an intersection into another shopping center across the street that we saw the driver enter. But we figured that we could prowl instead of chase, just in case we saw them again. But, unfortunately, we never found that car again. We never found out who the driver was, what his motive was, or if the cops found him. We knew that it was a male driver because we saw him through his driver's side window before he blinded us. It was a white male, dark ball cap. He drove a dark sedan. Looks like a newer Ford Fusion, I think. It was definitely a close run-in and I'm not sure what would have happened if he had successfully crashed into us on that deserted mile road. Or if his spotlight had successfully veered my car off the road. We don't think this was a case of road rage too since... We didn't do anything to provoke him, but whatever the case, I'm just glad that we got out of that situation safely. So this happened about four years ago. I was 20 at the time. The first time that I met the guy who would become my grocery store stalker, he was standing outside the store collecting money for the Salvation Army Christmas time donations. I'm a fairly friendly person, so I like to say hi to people who work at places I frequent, to be nice. This guy was a kid around my age, very tall with a mild resemblance to Lurch from the Adams Family, dark circles under dark eyes, short black hair, kind of vacant looking in his eyes. But I chatted with him for maybe two minutes, just idle chit chat about the weather and whatnot. Nothing particularly memorable or interesting and and waved goodbye and went home. Little did I know, though, that that single moment would have me genuinely afraid. So about four or five months passed, and I hadn't seen him again. Then one day, as I was grocery shopping with a friend, when, as we were chatting, she suddenly got really quiet and kind of recoiled backwards, looking behind me. I turned around to see this guy, who... Had to be at least 6'4", towering over me, not 8 inches from my body. He said hi and told me that he remembered me from that December that I had talked to him, and then asked for my number. I, being young and never had experienced this type of interaction before, told him that I didn't have my number memorized, but that I would write his down and text it to him later. I kind of half waved my phone at him, pointing out my at the time boyfriend whose picture was my wallpaper, making a point to say, oh look, that's my boyfriend, to the guy, hoping that he would clue in, but no luck. He told me his number, which immediately upon getting, I blocked, without letting him get my phone number. However, what really made my blood run cold was what he said after I put my phone away. You see, he leaned in real close, and in a low voice, he told me, whatever I text you is for your eyes only. At this point, I started feeling genuinely uncomfortable. I said, uh, yeah, sure, uh, nice talking to you, but we gotta get back to shopping. And I grabbed my friend and dragged her off, shooting a panicked look at her and asking why she didn't bail me out. Apparently, he scared her too with his getting so close to me and she didn't know what to do. I want to make it clear too that I'm not exactly a small girl. At 5'8 and pretty solidly built, I can certainly handle myself and I very rarely feel intimidated or small in the presence of anyone, male or female, but this guy, he made me feel tiny and scared. In the months that would follow, he would make me feel truly frightened though and I had hoped that the creepy interaction would be the last time that I saw him, but that was unfortunately not the case. 
After that initial meeting with him, saying that creepy thing about his text being for my eyes only, it seemed like I would run into him almost every single time that I got to the store. No matter what checkout lane I was in, he always seemed to appear at the end of it when I was finished shopping, and every time I was in the store I would notice him out of the corner of my eye just watching me, no matter what area I was in. One time I even caught him following me out to my car, and it was at that point that I got scared and decided to say something to the managers. After letting the managers know what was going on, they assured me that they would tell him not to talk to me. After that, he wouldn't speak to me, but I would continue to see him following me around the store at a distance every time that I went up there. It got so bad and I felt so frightened that I started to be afraid to go to the store at all. But I'm one of those stubborn people who just refuses to be intimidated by someone to the point where I'll stop doing something. I had hoped that maybe it was just a coincidence that he was following me. After all, it was a big store and maybe he just had things to do that just happened to be in the areas that I was shopping in. So I started to pay close attention to my surroundings. Once I started really paying attention too, I realized that Every single time I was up there, I would constantly notice him in the areas of the store that I was in. During my last encounter with him, I went up to the store to grab just two or three items I needed for dinner that night, and I first saw him standing outside the store when I got there, and with his back to me, I quickly ran inside, hoping that he didn't see me. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, I saw him at the very back of the store, and items in hand, I immediately made a beeline towards the front. As soon as I got near the checkout, I ducked behind one of the shelf displays and watched carefully at the front of the store to see if this guy would appear, and he did. I watched as he looked up and down the checkout, and when he didn't see me there, I saw him step outside. At this point, I quickly ran into the nearest open cashier, rang up my items, and stuck my head out the door to look for him. I didn't see him there immediately, so I started trying to make my way back to where I was parked. I had parked a ways away near the side of the store where a bunch of other smaller stores and restaurants were lined up and I was walking towards my car when I realized that I saw him standing by the entrance that I had first entered the store through and quickly ducked behind a pillar immediately hoping that he didn't see me. I watched carefully from behind the pillar and as he scanned the parking lot he obviously couldn't find me. After a minute or two he started to walk out towards the direction of the parking lot in front of the store, and so I took that opportunity to make a run for it to my car as soon as he was far enough away that I felt safe. Now, as soon as I got into my car, I locked all the doors, and to my horror, when I looked up, he was standing there about 15 feet away from my car with a shopping cart in front of him. I knew too that he had followed me, and he knew that I knew as well. I fully believed that he had chased after me and when I made it to my car, he grabbed the nearest car to make it look like he was collecting them for the parking lot. And I just remember feeling absolutely terrified at that moment. I quickly went home and immediately told my grandfather what had happened. I began crying and shaking and my grandfather told me to get in the car. We were going to settle this. He and I drove up to the store in his car and he walked me into the store and demanded that we spoke with the managers immediately, both of them. When the managers arrived at customer service, he asked me to tell them what had been happening and demanded that they ensure he left me alone or he would involve the police. The managers swore up and down that they would take care of it. As far as I know, he wasn't fired immediately because my friend who first encountered him with me when this whole thing began told me that she would see him from time to time when she was there by herself, but that any time that I went with her that she would never see him. I fully believe that he knew whenever I was there, only this time instead of stalking me, he was avoiding me now. Eventually, everyone who knew the situation stopped seeing him there, so I think he may have gotten fired or maybe he moved on from that store. By the way, I haven't had any issues since, but... I have never, ever in my life felt so afraid of another human being as I did that day seeing him eye contact with me in the parking lot as I was locking my car doors. 
It still really creeps me out too to think that he was watching me so closely every time that I entered that store and that he could so easily avoid or follow me whenever and wherever he wanted. One day I was making a six hour drive. It was one that I had made several times as I was selling a house in another state, also while relocating. I was a female in my late twenties and was traveling with my puggle. He's a good dog and would try to protect me, but he just doesn't have the size to do much. So I had about two hours left of my drive and needed to get some gas or petrol. I pulled off the interstate to a small town with a gas station, not far from the interstate. It was a very sunny day and I didn't even think about jumping out to pump my gas. After I started pumping, I realized that I'm like the only vehicle at this station. It was then too that I noticed two men standing around the front of the station and they start walking towards me in my vehicle. At first I think that they're just going to ask for money, but then I get this really creepy feeling with the way that they were looking at me. I start to panic and knowing that I probably can't get the hose out of my car and get back in before they're upon me. At that moment, a minivan pulls in with a mum and two large teenage boys. The boys hop out to go inside and as soon as they are seen, the men walk back to where they were standing. And now, I know that they didn't just want money. I get in my car and I call my then boyfriend, now husband, and tell him the story as I'm a bit shaken. He gets the location and quickly calls the local police and they know where this station is and said that they would go and check out the men. A little later they end up calling my boyfriend and tell him that they were thankful that he called as the men they had warrants out for their arrest and they had brought them in. So I was 16 years old and huge into photography. I lived in a rural area and I liked to go out for hikes on Tuesdays after school to a local reservoir to take some pictures with an old SLR. I pretty much parked in the same spot every time too. This is because it was a great way to get to the main trail and I could also go either way. Usually I was by myself. It wasn't a hugely populated area and not many people were ever there too. The parking place was usually used for school buses to turn around pretty much and that was about it. But after a while of going there, I started to see this little blue Toyota there. And there was some little old man in it, but he didn't say anything or get out of his vehicle ever. He would just wave at me and I would politely wave back. But one day, I was sitting in my back seat with the door open. I was prepping my film and getting the rolls I needed for the hike when suddenly he was right next to me. And before I could react, he put his arm around me and told me, I'm going to kiss you now. Man, I didn't know how to react, so I just shoved him. He was an older man, maybe in his late 60s or so. He didn't fall, but he definitely stumbled. And he told me that I should have expected it since I was coming up there teasing him all the time like that and said, I'll see you again soon, sweetie. I watched him drive off and promptly just broke down. Obviously, I... Uh, I cancelled my hike for the day and just sort of sat there for a while before going home. I didn't tell a single person about this experience until like a year ago. I'm not sure why this experience bothered me so much too, but still to this day, it just makes my skin crawl. All of this happened when I was a kid, about five or six years old. I was living in a sort of small two-bedroom apartment with my mom, dad, and my younger brother. Our apartment was located in the first floor of a four-story apartment building, and I was sleeping in a small bedroom with my brother, who was three or four years old at the time. My parents' room was right next to ours. The living room was across the hallway and had a sort of small balcony which faced the courtyard of the building. It wasn't the best part of town by any means too, but a pretty safe city where crimes very rarely ever took place. Still though, my parents were cautious and always closed and locked all of the doors. Now one night, and I still remember very vividly, I woke up because I heard somebody walking around. 
I saw a dark figure standing in the middle of my room all of a sudden. And at first, I thought it was my mum taking my brother back to his bed, as he still often went into their room when he had nightmares. But then I realised that my brother was sleeping safe and sound, as I could hear him breathing slowly and calmly. Also, the figure was bigger and wider than my mum by quite a lot. Since it was so dark in the room, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. In fact, I wasn't even sure if it was a real person at all or just a shadow. In the past, I had often had trouble sleeping at night because I believed the shadows in my room were monsters staring at me. My mother always told me that if I closed my eyes, they couldn't hurt me. And so I just closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. After a little bit of time though, I want to say maybe a few minutes, but it might have been just a few seconds. I'm not really sure, but my brother woke up and started crying. He got up and ran into my parents' bedroom. I kept laying still in my bed, keeping my eyes closed so the shadows would go away. And the next thing I remember was waking up in the morning as if nothing had ever happened. Now, I know that you could easily brush this off as just a kid having a nightmare, but hear me out, because here's where things get a little creepy. So at breakfast, my brother couldn't stop talking about the men that he saw, the men who were watching us. And my father told him to stop talking nonsense until I said that I saw a man too. But now my father got a bit angry, saying that if we kept talking about scary stories like this, we'd have trouble falling asleep at night. But my mum started freaking out a bit, because she said in the middle of the night, she too woke up to a strange noise. She looked up and saw a man standing in the doorway. When she reached over to get her glasses and take a better look at the guy, he was gone. But she also thought that it was just a shadow, when a few moments later, my brother came running into her room. Well, upon all of this, we immediately looked at all the doors and the windows. The main door was locked, along with pretty much everything else. However, we discovered the balcony door was actually unlocked. My parents checked all of our belongings, every valuable item that we had, but nothing was missing. Everything was exactly the way that it was the evening before, but we reported the incident to the police. They weren't able to find any signs of breaking or anything, no fingerprints and pretty much nothing. But my parents, they must have forgotten to lock the balcony door the night before. Needless to say, none of us slept well for the next couple of nights. Thankfully, though, this was the only time that these men ever seemed to come to our house. But I think it's the fact that nothing was actually taken. It's always made it feel even more creepier to me. I mean, with burglars at least, you know that they're after your stuff and not you, right? So first off, I just want to say that I don't really remember this story because, well, I was just a young kid when it happened, around four or five. But I do remember the nightmares and also my parents and I still talk about it. So when I was just a kid, my parents moved into a larger house to start a family. I had an older sister who was around 17 at the time, along with my mom and dad, and there were four of us in total. My parents decided on a white farmhouse out in the country with an old decrepit barn and a few outbuildings on the large plot of land that we now owned. So I remember having really bad night terrors about a tall man made of shadows at this place. One nightmare that I still remember vividly after 12 years too was that my room was actually on fire and I was sat in the corner of my bedroom crying as the tall shadow man stood over me and just watched me. Spooky, right? Well, my father used to work the midnight shift for a prison about 20 minutes away from our house. And one night, my mother woke up because she heard my dad come back home right after he left for work, so probably sometime after midnight. He apparently walked down the hallway towards my and my mother's room. Our rooms were right across from each other at the end of a long hallway. And then just stop outside of her open door. She claims that she called out to him, but he didn't respond and that she couldn't see him despite having the door open and my nightlight shining from out of the room, towards the hallway that is. When my mum asked my dad about it the next day, he said that he never came back home that night. My mother also claims that she had heard footsteps when nobody else was home, 
And she was a stay-at-home mother and my sister and I went to school. And that she felt the bed move after dad left for work one time. Now, I've had a lot of vivid nightmares at that house, but I don't remember a lot of them and they sort of stopped happening as I got older too. My dad still feels bad about not being able to protect us from the evil ghosts and tells me that he used to walk into my room and start pleading with an unseen force to leave his family alone. But as surprising as it may seem, I sort of loved living in that house though, and I was sad when we had to move away. Looking back, a lot of weird things happened in that house, but I never really cared and was more interested in playing with my little sister all the time. I had a lot of nightmares, deja vu, along with both of my parents. I've never asked my older sister about it, but you know, after sharing this, maybe I should. I don't know. Either way, it's an old story and it's from a long time ago, so thanks for listening. So, I had an encounter a few months ago, and well, I, I feel that maybe this is a good place to share it. I was sitting in my living room watching TV around 8.30pm, and it was already pretty dark outside. All of a sudden, I hear knocks on my door, so I get up to see who's there. No one that I know ever knocks on the door, they just walk right in. But anyway, standing on my porch are these three guys just one look at them and uh, I was freaked out as well. They seem like almost caricatures of humans but ones that walk straight out from an abyss and onto my doorstep. I keep thinking about Mad TV Kid, you know? But they were dressed up like Mormon boys in suits and their name tags only said Jesus Christ. They never introduced themselves and they kept asking for people by name which I don't know how they knew anyone's names from here. And honestly, I really just can't convey how uncomfortable they made me feel. I can barely remember their faces now, but the one guy in the middle was just sort of staring and smiling the entire time. I don't know how, but my instincts were telling me that something was very wrong. I never opened the door fully, and I got out of the conversation by telling them that I was cold and didn't really feel like talking. And I haven't seen or heard of anything about them since then, it's been months now, and still just thinking about it, though, it makes me sick to my stomach. I know that this is going to sound weird, but I really don't think that those guys were, well, human. Am I overreacting? Maybe. I know it sounds crazy to say, but maybe somebody else here has had a similar experience. This is a bit of a long one, so uh, strap yourselves in. Uh, I've always been uh, borderline obsessive about locking my doors. I did it as a kid and as a teenager I learned through experience that a locked door is at least a deterrent and can give someone warning that a person who wants to illegally enter their space. It's something that I'm known for in fact. Even at social gatherings I'll lock all the doors behind me when I come in without even thinking about it. I've heard the line so many times, who locked the door, followed by that flush of embarrassment because of course it was me and now I have to say it. For over a decade I've done nightly checks because I can't sleep without doing so. Knowing this is a preface to my story and highlights just how strange this situation is. So I've just only recently moved here about five months ago from a way more heavily populated place in my state. The house where we reside is set far back from any pavement road, separated by two dirt roads and two private driveways. My rental is on another person's property, so you go down their private drive and off to the side is my own private drive. And I've never even seen a pedestrian back here. In other words, it's nice and really private. No one can even come here without explicit instructions, and often I still have to meet them down the road as GPS places my house like a few fields to the south of where it actually is. It's a paradise though for people like me who really value their privacy and don't like having visitors without prior notice. The house is semi surrounded by trees and brush with a field on the other two sides. I'll admit that it took a bit to get used to just how out in the sticks it is. 
hearing coyotes often, sometimes crows screaming in the night, and the darkness of having no nearby sources of light pollution. The nearest town is like over 20 miles away, but get used to it, we did. Another relevant tidbit as well I should probably mention is that I don't sleep in a completely dark house. I always, and I mean always, leave lights on in the common area. Usually only one, but I light nevertheless. Now, the back door leads off into the trees, but it didn't feel so creepy as a few yards in there is like a six foot tall wire fence laden with vines and offering further privacy. No one uses the back door anyway. I mean, there really is no reason to. But a month in, I found myself locked out. Unfortunately, I often lock the door handle on my way out, out of reflex really, as my conscious mind is the part where I know if I have my keys, but my subconscious takes over when I'm distracted. I knew though that I'd only locked the handle on the back door and I figured that I could just pop it open to get myself in. I checked the door out and it was pristine. None of those minute scratches that are present when you take a flat metal object and pop the lock on a cheap door or something. I didn't want to damage it either so I swallowed my pride and I called the landlord admitting that I had locked myself out and I needed back in. He came and let me in and I worked on being more mindful after that. A little more than a week later I wake up thirsty one night. I walk groggily to the kitchen and... As soon as I open my bedroom door, I realize that it's way darker than it should be. Which means that my ever-burning light is out. I wonder briefly if there's a power outage, but I can still hear my fan behind me in the room that I just vacated, so that can't be it. I take another step and the hair instantly stands up on the back of my neck. That feeling that someone is watching. Another step, and it's beyond feeling. It's now a conviction. I turn my head to the left, where instinct says the person is standing, and for a split second I'm relieved. Nobody's there. In the next instant, though, that relief abandons me as I notice that I can see stars where only darkness should be. My back door is wide open. I take two very fast steps backwards, out of view of anything that could be in my backyard. Knowing I'm responsible for more people's safety than just my own, I don't retreat for long, almost immediately stepping back forward and further. I have to shut the door, of course. The entire path there, I just know that someone is out there in the darkness, waiting until I'm just close enough to get snatched. But I reach out into the pitch darkness for the knob, expecting to feel a hand close over mine at any second. After a moment of panic-driven fumbling, my hand makes contact with the knob and I pull it shut with a slam. I go to turn the lock and find that it's still engaged. Maybe, just maybe this once, the door wasn't completely shut. Like, maybe the latch didn't actually fully engage. The turned off light remained a mystery, of course. I mean, both my boys said it wasn't them, and that's very believable too, because well, they've never really done it before. Both of them like having a light to find the bathroom and such, so in the end, I just sort of write it off as strange but nothing else was amiss so it was just one of those things that will never have a full explanation from that point forward though i definitely put my weight into the door anytime that i checked or locked it from my rare but occasional trips to the backyard and life goes on i almost put it into the back of my mind in fact almost until three weeks later so i wake up from a nightmare for the last 10 years, I haven't even had a dream that I can remember, but I do occasionally have nightmare clusters. My mouth is dry, my bladder is throbbing. It was one of those bad ones where you wake up making inarticulate sounds, trying to scream from a sleep-paralyzed mouth. It was deja vu as well, because after my bathroom trip, I emerge into a dark kitchen. Two steps in, and someone is watching, I'm sure of it. The door is wide open again, a panicked quick retreat followed by a fear-fueled moment of bravery where I rush forward and close the door, sure at that very moment that I'm about to be torn into the night and slaughtered. But it was strange. I know for sure that the door didn't just pop open on its own this time. So what the, what the heck is going on? 
My adrenaline rush finally crashes as I lay in bed afterwards, trying to figure this all out. I've left my bedroom door open this time, so I can hear anything that's going on in the house. And I finally fall back to sleep with two hours to spare before I have to get up again. When I get back up to wake my boys up, I'm halfway to the coffee maker before I see it. The facing door is open again. This time there was no real feeling of being observed. The lights are still on in the kitchen as well. But this time, I do what I already should have done ages ago and check the door in the jam for evidence of tampering. And this time, there's definitely new scratches and bend marks where the aluminium gave when being pried open. And I guess that at least this means that it's not a ghost or a demon or something. But again, I don't really know what to do about it, and life goes on. Two weeks after that, the chickens pen 30 feet or so from my bedroom window crow long into the night. Even the hens are a part of the show this time, with the hens making eerie little screams. It makes my sleep fitful, not very restful, and I wake up at like 2 in the morning when my fan goes off because the power's out. Damn. I get up to utilize the lantern and to light a couple of kitchen candles to save anyone needing to get up in the night from traversing the house in the darkness. But two steps in, cue the hair on the back of my neck again, and this time I can hear the crickets before I even turned my head, because the door is of course open again. Well, after I survive yet another door shutting, I spent a lot of the day thinking about this. There was more damage this time too, scratches and gouges in the jam this morning. I try to rationalize how this could possibly be happening, and I can't think of anything that makes sense. Any innocent reasons I can attribute to it go straight out the window when I remember that this has never happened even once in the daytime. I think maybe that I've missed the scratches, that... They were already there and my paranoid brain told me that they were worse, which I guess could be feasible. Except that I remembered that it was in such good condition that I didn't have the heart to pop open the door myself. It was at this stage that I decided to change the deadbolts around. But the front door was a, a square lead, I think. The back has a sloping one that I'm honestly sure is actually backwards in the door. But work picks up and eventually life moves on again. That night I'm exhausted. I can't find my Phillips head so in place of changing the locks I put an errant Christmas decoration adorned with bells to place in the door handle and I go to sleep. It's never happened two nights in a row anyway. I even considered setting up a camera but I thought of that little fact in my musings when I was laying down. Plus to be honest I'm honestly a little bit scared to actually see what it would catch. For once though, I'm actually to bed early, and I fall off as soon as my head hits the pillow pretty much. Cue the nightmares again. This night, I wake up for the first time at midnight on the dot. And yet again, dark kitchen, back door open, scary as heck. I fall back asleep, I wake up at about 1.30. The door is open again. I wake up at 3 to the enormous relief that the door is closed. I fall back asleep, right into a nightmare. In this nightmare, I can hear Christmas bells. I come upon a little girl with a back turned to me, and in that weird nightmare logic, I'm at first not afraid of her. I ask her what her name is, and she responds with, Someone's coming, someone's coming, chanting it, over and over. She starts getting louder, and after a few crescending repetitions, all the while Christmas bells are in the background. She turns to me, jaw on her chest, mouth unnaturally wide, and screams, someone's here. I pop awake instantly. It's five, and a false dawn shines faintly through my window. I immediately get up to go and check the door, and, of course, the kitchen is dark, and the door is open yet again. But surprisingly, this time there was no feeling of being watched. It kind of feels like the, the danger has passed. Kind of like gun smoke in the air after the main event has passed. I close the door and to my absolute horror, I turn to find the Christmas bells laid neatly on my dryer. No longer attached to the door. I talked to my boys that morning. 
Ask them about if they'd heard anything the night before. My 13-year-old says nothing, nothing at all. Except, no, wait, I got up at like 2.30 to pee and the back door was open and I shut it. I asked him about the bells and he was pretty sure that they were there on the handle. I switched the locks that day and a few days ago there was more damage to the door but so far the lock seems to be whole. It wasn't long after that too that I set up the camera and waited. One night after I fixed the lock there there were more scratches on the door like someone tried to pry the lock again. The camera picked up nothing and unfortunately it doesn't pick up audio so there was nothing to really go on. And about, I think about two weeks after some of the last strange occurrences, I had left my bag in my car with my allergy meds and nasal spray inside. I woke up in the night and couldn't breathe through my nose because I was getting a cold. I went outside through my front door and walked around the side of the house to the carport. I have one light out front, but it's just standard porch light, so it doesn't reach very far. The edge of a pretty dense group of trees is about 30 feet out from my door, I would say. It only stretches about 20 feet across as there's a driveway on one side and a clear field on the other. But as I was walking out, I heard some movement in it, I'm sure. At first I wasn't very concerned as I live out in the country after all and it's not uncommon to hear animal life out there. Most of them won't approach people but I did note it and looked in that direction. The combination of low light, density on the trees and brush made trying to see what made the noise pretty futile but... I just didn't see anything. So I reached into my car and I grabbed my bag and walked back towards my house. But then the noise repeated and this time it sounded an awful lot like heavy bipedal animal. I stopped near my stairs and turned to try and see what it was. But as soon as I looked the noise stopped. I could have been wrong but... It was strange that the looking halted the noises, like whatever was out there was watching and saw me look and stopped. So, I said, Uh, hello? Is there anyone out there? Nothing. Just silence. I stood there looking for a minute, goosebumps all over. I yelled again, but there was nothing. But what made it worse, though, was that there were no insect sounds either, which I'm sure was not part of it, but really creepy nonetheless. For a solid minute, I just sort of looked, trying to will my eyes to see whatever was the cause of the noises. I turned to walk up my stairs, and whatever, or perhaps whoever, was out there took off in the opposite direction. I'm quite positive that it was a person, because it went through the brush away from me at first, but within a few steps it had broke to the left for the darkened driveway on that side. What I am certain of though is that it was definitely someone or something on two feet and it was heavy. And I can tell you as well that the sound of those running footsteps will stay with me for a long time. And boy am I glad that they were going in the other direction. The next day as well I went and checked my dirt driveway and yep, there were footprints. But there were others among them from this work crew that had happened the day before. In my neighborhood, there's a group of people who live there that grades the roads and does like tree work and stuff. It's needed and appreciated because even a slight storm here can knock down road blocking branches. I even go out and help sometimes because it's quite nice to do it. Now, there were a few sets of course, but one set in particular looked really fresh, had a wide stride with divots from pushing off at speed by the looks of things. Once I got to where the driveway met the dirt road, there was no way to trace where they had gone. Of course, by then the prints had already been obliterated by the tire tracks of early risers. As far as evidence goes, it wasn't much, I know. I mean, they could have been made the day before, so who knows. Interestingly enough, though, after that, there was just nothing. All was quiet. No more strange sounds in the night, no more waking up to an open door. I've learned to trust my instincts through this because I never again walked into my house and felt watched or not alone. All of this only really makes sense in context too, so let me tell you what I learned later. So after a month or so of this piece, I was feeling pretty good. I didn't know why it had all of a sudden stopped. 
even if whoever was in the trees that night was the perpetrator. I doubt that I'd even scared them off that night, let alone completely. But I tried not to question my good fortune. I was curious, though, as to what had actually happened. Why had any of this happened at all, in fact? And what was the goal here? Why did it all of a sudden feel as if whatever cloud I'd been living under was lifted? I truly believed that every single time I felt watched during that time was legit now. I mean, it wasn't just me, because I felt it when it was gone, and it's too much to be coincidental with the timing and all that. But here's the reason I think this, and my theory as well. So I was talking to my landlord one afternoon. He lives close by, and when I see him out, I often walk over, and he also comes over occasionally when he sees me as well. He had been pretty busy lately, not only with all the social groups and such that he's in, but he'd also been doing a, a lot of traveling. So for a month or so, I hadn't really talked to him. Our conversation meandered to the topic of the neighbor to my left side. He was a, a strange one, but up until this point had seemed pretty much harmless. He spent most of his time in his house, and I thought it was because of maybe a slight agoraphobia or something, as he rarely went anywhere and seemed to have most things delivered. And I know, I know, trust me, sharing this now, there's already lots of foreshadowing that I should have seen, but people rarely see things like this when they're actively in the situation. I didn't know the guy well, but he wasn't super friendly. The mornings that I would see him, he was always out in his robe and boxes on his porch or in his yard. I would wave, but he never waves back with the exception of once. I think that once was an accident, maybe. Like he half waved and seemed to realize who I was and dropped his hand. My landlord told me in the conversation that he was quite sure this guy had a, a very outdated opinion on women. I had mentioned that he never waved and that's what he responded with. The reason he guessed that he didn't. But here's the interesting point though. He said something to the effect of, Well, I don't think you have to worry about that anymore anyway. As in his antisocial attitude. So I, of course, asked him why. He was of the opinion that his house was about to be foreclosed on and that he had made a run for it early. Basically, he went to live with family or hooked a rental before the police showed up to formally evict him. He wasn't sure, of course. It was just a hypothesis. But honestly, I thought maybe he was on disability or something prior to this as he never seemed to go to work. But he clearly had some way to pay his bills. Or well, so I thought at least. But I started to pay more attention, and I think that my landlord is correct, in fact. But the sheriff's office showed up with papers one day, but as far as I've seen, no one came to the door. His yard isn't overgrown, but it's mostly shade and covered with leaves. Besides, no one really has to cut their grass due to the weather at the moment. I don't know for sure, but the house does feel empty. There's also a tent that has been set up in the backyard for about two months now. Some people don't take very good care of their things, but up until a few months ago, I wouldn't have thought that that was in character, as he did take care of his yard pretty well and kept all of his tools properly housed. A good indicator would be a vehicle, of course, but I never saw a vehicle there to begin with. It could have been in the garage, though, so I'm not sure if he was just careless or always put his car up or what. But today, I'm actually going to go up there. I'm going to knock on the door and... I hope he's not laying dead in there, but I would really think that I would have smelled him by now if so, even with the cooler weather. Not to be morbid or anything, I just have to consider it as a possibility. After all, I haven't seen him since a day or so before the tree footsteps, which is strange, I'll admit. But I really just don't know at this point. Anyways, the leading hypothesis in my mind is that it was him. I can't speak for motive, though. And maybe he was working himself up to do something worse, or maybe he was just trying to scare me off, or maybe he had some type of mental issue and the whole thing was a part of a plan that I'll never understand, or maybe he just wanted money. I don't know, but, but what I do know is that ever since the time near when it's guessed that he took off, I have had zero issues. For instance, I haven't come home to an empty house with the feeling that someone had just left. I haven't had very small things come up misplaced when I swore up and down that I put it where it no longer was. Obviously, no waking up in the night swearing someone was just staring at me, only to look out my bedroom door to a pitch black house with an open back door. 
I didn't even know that he was gone, to be honest, but there has been a noticeable atmosphere difference. The feelings change was subtle, and since I had no idea what the cause was, I couldn't say for sure what was different. All I do know is that I went from desperately wanting to move to getting pretty comfortable in my own home again. Anyway, I like to think the best of people. I really do, so even though he was considered a suspect, even when I shared the original post, I thought it was possible. It just seemed sort of so outlandish. But the one thing was, though, is that as I think I mentioned before, there's a camera that sees part of my property that doesn't belong to me. And coincidentally, the problems were occurring in the side of the yard that the camera couldn't see. While a simple recon would show the camera for what it was pretty quickly, there's a red light on it which is very visible at night, which to an outsider would immediately scream camera. Anyone breaking the law would be wary of it on sight. But a neighbor would know even better where the weak spots were in a house which for me is anything beyond the house's front. So when I was 16, I was dating a guy who was just a little bit older than me, and his name was Mitch. My parents never let us hang out alone, but to my surprise, they let him come on a family camping trip with us once. I think because it was a, kind of a special occasion since the camping season was ending, and also because the site that we were going to had been a kind of a, a tradition for us. But this season when it closed, it would never again reopen for camping, because people ruined it by dumping trash and trespassing nearby properties. Anyway, so my dad, mum, Mitch and I are all going camping. And Mitch and I have our own tent, my parents have theirs, we have an amazing first day there, we went on Friday morning and planned to stay through Sunday night. Mitch and I spent the day walking along paths, catching lizards, swimming, exploring, and just talking about creepy pastas that involve the woods. At some point we were exploring and realized that there were nearby properties, maybe two or three cabins about four miles down a dirt road from a campsite. Later that night, my parents made a big fire and we were eating burgers. My parents were drinking and Mitch and I were trying to make s'mores while also trying to pretend that we weren't terrified after talking about creepy bastards all day long. I'm in the middle of trying to explain the rake to my sloshed parents and Mitch gasps because there's a guy walking down the road from the direction of the cabins. Again, it was like four miles away. So we all kind of get quiet. My dad calls out to the guy something like, hey, how's it going? And the guy doesn't say anything back. My dad called again, yelling, Are you camping? We have this spot reserved. Not in like a, a mean way, just trying to get the guy to respond. The guy still doesn't say anything until he's like right up to our campsite, which was really weird because it took like two minutes of silent walking to get to us after we first called out to him. He comes up closer to us and is like, uh, Hey there, folks. Uh, I was just walking around. Sometimes I take a walk down here from the cabin and see if anyone's camping. Then this guy sits down and talks to my parents for a while. My parents are super drunk and I think they've been smoking something as well all day. I didn't know this at the time but when I was older they told me that they were pretty big potheads my whole childhood. Because they were surprisingly chill with this strange man appearing and were really friendly. They all talked about what a shame it was the camping season was ending and how terrible it was that this campsite was closing, etc. Mitch and I whispered though back and forth and were talking about how weird this guy was, how weird it was that he walked this far, didn't talk at first, and just invited himself into our campsite. But then we started noticing other things. Mitch pointed out that the guy's zipper was down, and he had some lengthy cargo shorts and his boxes were like poking out, and then I pointed out that in this entire interaction, the guy had been there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes now, talking to my parents. He hadn't even acknowledged us with a single word, despite sitting across the fire from us and continuously looking at us. Then, we both noticed how the guy was sort of mimicking my parents. He went from being sort of drunk to sober, then to acting like he was drunk. He started slurring his words, getting a bit wobbly, laughing which sounded very strained, and being just generally louder. Mitch and I were so freaked out, in fact, that we'd been talking about all the creepypastas all day, and this encounter felt like a creepypasta, 
and the guy kept getting stranger and stranger and there was just no way to say something to my parents without him hearing. Mitch and I eventually stood up and walked a few feet behind us over to the cooler and pretended to get out some stuff to make some hot dogs. And as soon as we had backed off a few feet, the guy switched the convo to talk about us. He asked my parents if this was a double date and they explained that I was their kid and Mitch was my boyfriend. He asked how old we were and they told him I was 16 and he was 18. He asked if we were good kids and they said yes. Then he asked, well, where are they going to be sleeping tonight? I froze and looked at Mitch, who had reached out and squeezed the heck out of my forearm in fear and was staring at me wide-eyed. To my drunk, maybe even high parents, this question didn't seem weird enough to even pause. The guy was still pretending to be drunk, and he was really playing it up at this point, nearly falling off the tote that he was sitting on. But my parents were like, laughing, mind you. Yeah, we are. Uh, we got them their own tent. The guy said something like, Oh wow, that's really nice of you guys. That'll be an experience for them, right? I can't explain it, but the way that he said it was just really sexual. I think this too was when my parents kind of clued on to the weirdness. I looked at my mum, who looked kind of slack-jawed and uncomfortable, and was staring at me with a quizzical look. The guy kept talking, asking them, Well, I see one tent, where's the other one? My dad was still talking to him and could barely keep his eyes open at this point. He was so out of it. My dad motioned towards my parents' tent and said that that was theirs, and then threw his arm back super exaggerated in the direction of our tent, really not very far at all, and was like, and theirs is way over there. The guy perked right up and actually stood up a bit, and pointed to their tent and said, oh, uh, so that's your tent? And my dad agreed. And their tent is in that direction? And my dad agreed again. At this point, I was actually shaking my head at my mum, and she looks pretty sobered up all of a sudden. The guy keeps talking to my dad about the tents and about how we can't see Mitch and I's tent from there, about how it must be pretty well hidden or very far away, and that's so nice of my parents for letting us have some alone time, etc. And Mitch and I say that we're going on a walk, and despite the woods being pitch black and us being creeped out, we got out walking down the trail, the trail the guy happened to come from. We get far enough away not to hear them and can barely see the fire now, and we pull our phones out to see if we have call signal, and of course we don't. I'm being super dramatic, and I type out and send my friend a long message describing the situation, the date, the time, the description of the guy, and that I love her, and my phone gives me the message that it'll send it when it finds service. The whole time I type, I'm reading it out loud to Mitch, and he's telling me stuff to add. We try to psych ourselves up and start walking back to the campfire, and when we do... The guy is gone. But I thought maybe he was just peeing, so I whispered to my mum asking where he is. Now my parents are both like, uh, he went back to his cabin a bit ago. He didn't pass on you on the road, did he? We're just like, what? We start freaking out now, but we also feel a bit safer now that he's actually gone and we can talk to my parents. And we start yelling a mile a minute at my parents about how he didn't pass us, about his fly being down and him acting drunk too much to them, about how he really pressed to know where we'd sleep that night and all that stuff. And my mum agreed with us and said that she noticed that too and it did freak her out as well. My dad was pretty trash though but said that he got a really creepy vibe from the guy Mitch and I stayed with them though and we talked about the guy and how freaked we were for about another hour and then my parents wanted to go to bed. Mitch and I went and ran to our tent and we basically just hauled ass with the whole tent and all of our belongings in it getting thrown around and we slid it right up next to my parents tent and we couldn't sleep all night long because every crunchy leaf made us think that the guy was creeping up on us. Ben and I met on Facebook in 2014, and he came to meet me in Romania in the summer of 2015. He seemed uh, a little bit odd, but otherwise okay, I suppose. But one strange thing about him, though, is that while he was at my house for a week, he didn't bathe for some odd reason, so he really stank. 
So I show him around Transylvania, and we both rent an apartment before his departure. We hang around there, and he leaves. Our friendship continues online, and in 2016, I move back to Canada. In May of that year, I fly over to Vancouver to hang out with him. Now, it's important to know that this guy is a major gun nut. He collects a lot of firearms and claims to have briefly been in the Canadian Army. He also claims that he worked as a mercenary and was in Georgia during the Russian invasion in 2008. He claimed to have shot two people there and also suffers from PTSD. But anyway, I get there and his apartment is just filthy. I'm talking trash everywhere, two cats that made the place stink of cat piss. The guy kept his lights on 24-7 and on his wall was a clock that played a loud tune every hour. His behavior towards me while there was somewhat disrespectful, but I just took it as a buddy messing around with me. He did say mildly creepy things, but again, I just sort of brushed it off as him being a prankster. I leave and again, our friendship continues online. During this time, his conversations with me became sort of darker and more hostile in a passive-aggressive sort of way. But Ben is also a hardcore alcoholic who drinks until he passes out. He does all sorts of really antisocial and downright vile things while drunk. Also during this time, 2016 to 2017 period, he said that two men briefly lived with him for a short time. When I'd press him about what happened to those two men who lived with him, He'd always just change the subject really quickly. And after what happened in 2018 when I last met up with Ben, I now have a strong suspicion that something bad might have happened to them. So fast forward to 2018 and me and my parents are driving to Vancouver from Calgary. And it's a perfect time to meet up for a day or two with Ben. But boy, was that a big mistake. Ben is traveling to Vancouver and we meet up at a bar near his house. We have a few drinks and he goes home for the night. The next day we meet up and his behavior towards me is really disrespectful in a passive aggressive sort of way and extremely creepy. We go to his workplace and he's very subtly disrespectful to me and his co-workers as well. He's putting me on the spot as well and trying to make me look stupid in front of everyone. He was a supervisor, so most of the people underneath him were too complacent or afraid to say anything. And at the time, I thought that this man is obviously some sort of a psychopath. And this is where it gets to a point where I honestly believe that my life was in danger. So we go back to his place. He's drinking beer and I'm rolling a joint. A movie's playing and Ben is getting tipsy. He's basically now adopted a speech pattern in our conversation where I feel as though I'm being sort of interrogated or toyed with. He's playing a video game on his computer. I'm watching a movie. By this time, I'm feeling very uneasy. My gun instinct is telling me to just leave. Generally speaking as well, you probably should always listen to your gut instinct. It's that sort of primal thing inside of you linked to fight or flight that it's best to be obeyed. But as the day progressed and as Ben was becoming drunk, he starts saying some really weird things. He was mumbling about, I don't care for anyone but myself, I really don't care about people. There's a loaded shotgun beside the table as well. He looks at his computer screen and starts mumbling about being a madman with a gun. A few minutes later, he turns to me and says, Hey, what if I put some MDMA in your drink? Followed by... <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. The cat and the mouse game continues. He's now talking about knowing a guy who is HIV positive and how he's going to get the guy to give him an infected needle to infect himself with HIV so he can live on government benefits for the rest of his life. I mean, this guy is completely unhinged, obviously. I'm sitting there in disbelief as to just how vile this guy really is. And obviously, I really want to leave, but I also don't want him to know that I'm ready to go. It's a really weird sort of awful and vulnerable feeling. He has another beer and turns to me and I'm now very uncomfortable. The talk is about food and he then turns to me and looks me straight in the eyes and asks, So if this was your last meal, what would you have? The look on his face was one of stone-faced sincerity and malice. I knew that I had to flee. My heart was pounding. I need to make my move. 
With adrenaline rushing through my body, I, I tell Ben in a very calm manner that the weed I had is making me feel funny and I need a breath of fresh air. I quickly put on my shoes and I leave before he has any chance to stop me. He makes me promise I'll come back and I go downstairs into the sunlight and I feel like a, an animal that has just escaped slaughter. The place I'm staying at is not too far from Ben's house. I'm wise enough not to tell him where I'm staying at exactly and I start walking, feeling like I've just escaped certain death. The phone rings though, and Ben is asking where I'm at and that he's panicking. I tell him that I'm still taking a breather. Meanwhile, I get to my cousin's house and I somehow manage to get inside. Night eventually falls and the guy is calling my phone constantly. When I answer, he's trying to get me to meet up with him and go for a ride. But the tone of his voice was really flat and really fake. He says that we've just had a bad night. He's desperately trying to get me to go for a ride with him. But at this stage, I just sort of block his number. I block him on social media as well, and that was the last time that I spoke to that scumbag. In our many online conversations over the years, Ben would drop clues here and there about his past, that he did horrible things during his supposed gig as a mercenary. He would go on drunken tirades about being a bad man, having done bad things. He was going to AA meetings and trying to put on a facade of normality by volunteering at an old folks home, I think. But deep down, I, I honestly think that he was a psychopath. A potentially dangerous one at that, and I just hope that he, he never murdered anyone other than the two people he allegedly shot while in combat duty. Vancouver is a really sketchy place as well, full of missing people. But in the end, I guess we'll just never know. This happened to me and a few other guys about uh, two weeks ago now, I think it was. I'm a, I'm a career firefighter in SWFL. And we respond pretty regularly to medical alarm activation. And tonight, we were dispatched along with EMS to a medical alarm activation. Once on scene, we noted a small mobile home with no car and no lights on. So we did our standard knock on the front door, and we can clearly hear a woman calling for help. It was clear enough to the point, in fact, that we were able to narrow down the room that she was in from the outside. All the doors were locked, so myself and my partner climbed through a window and searched the entire house, only to find it absolutely empty and the creepiest part of it is that afterwards we talked with the ems guys who stayed outside and talked with her and they said that they were talking with her on the other side of the wall until they heard us in the same room it was definitely a spine tingling call many thoughts i uh i still feel really sick to my stomach and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. But, uh, anyway, here it goes. So I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now... I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in relatively near to my suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with a particular parasite that's basically deadly to most macropods, animals with pouches like marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and I went. I mean, why not, right? So I got my tub which contains my essentials, a hessian bag, ties, gloves and head torch and went on my way. The couple that called in the rue were at the entrance of the trail and they told me where it was. I actually knew them because our dogs like to play together and I was easily able to understand what part of the track that they were talking about and I trusted them. They offered to come with me but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So I just politely said no and that I got this. My area is very safe, mind you, and I've had no problems walking out late or at night or in the dark or anything. But anyway, 
I walked the 30 minutes up the hill into the reserve and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic that he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, mind you. Definitely not a medium and probably weighed around uh, 45 kilos, I would say. More than half my own body weight, easily. I normally wouldn't do these sorts of rescues as well because I know it pushes my physical capabilities. But I gently maneuver him back into the sack that I had in my tub, tie it such with some cables and I pop him in the tub. Now, having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very, very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching, the movements, the hissing, the growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time so that I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You sort of develop a, a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well, in fact, that I was once a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago before I got sick. When I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know that something isn't right. And sure as sure is, every hair on my body seemed to stand on end suddenly. I'm instantly on the balls of my feet, and I scan the surrounding area, thinking it could be a snake or a lost dog or something. But there's nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is way too heavy, so I have to stop every few meters and put it down to sort of stop the tub from cutting my hands. And then, all of a sudden, there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound that I knew of. It had to be a person. It was way too big, and there was also sudden silence, like whatever had made the noise had stopped or was stalking. So in the end, I just decided to say screw it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off the light and started booking it down the trail, sticking to the right side, just along the edge of the trees. I left my tub behind because, honestly, I doubt anyone would take it anyway. I was freaking out so much anyway that I couldn't care less. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got out of there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, though, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching or dead bark on the ground or something that was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time as well, my instincts are screaming for me to just run, run, run. I was gripping my bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. But eventually I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before... I dared to even stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder either because I could just feel someone watching me. I uh, started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mum and she obviously looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that, even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend though and she came over for the night and also came with me to try and find my rescue tub with me the next day. This morning another rescuer came to take the sick brew to the vet and me and Risa went back to the bush. We found it but the heavy duty plastic tub had been completely smashed up like someone had been jumping on it. And there were buds of what I could only assume were rolled up cigarettes and also an empty needle on the ground. I just silently picked up my broken tub and I threw it away when I got home. I really don't think as well that I'm going to be going out at night for a, a long, long while after that one. So I've been listening to some stories here for the last few days and it actually inspired me to talk about an experience that I had when I was about 12. My mum was actually taking things out of her closet to donate to Goodwill for a tax write-off. She called me down to ask if I wanted any of the shoes that she was getting rid of and I started rummaging around her closet and found an old Hasbro Ouija board. I sort of vaguely knew what it was but I never played with one so I asked her if she would play it with me. She agreed and said that when she was finished that she would. So later that evening she explained it more in detail how it worked and we set it up and began. I went into this thinking that it was honestly just a big joke. But the first thing the board spelled out was my mother's name. I was sort of giggly and said to my mum, you're moving it. And she of course replied that she wasn't. 
She asked the board who this is, and they replied with the name of my mum's boyfriend. His name was Ronnie, before she married my stepdad, Mark. Ronnie died in a motorcycle accident when I was four, and I hardly remembered him. She asked Ronnie if he could prove it was him, and he said a few things that only Ronnie could know. I still sort of thought that my mum was moving it, because she of course would also have this knowledge. But then Ronnie said that he had to warn her about Mark. He said that Mark was a bad man and would do something to hurt me and go to prison. He said Mark needed to leave right away. We were obviously both taken aback by this because Mark had always been an amazing father and husband to my mum. My mum asked what he was going to do to hurt me and the board just kept saying things like, he's a bad man, he's a dirty man, he will go to prison, he will be punished, nothing specific. My mum got annoyed eventually and said that the real Ronnie wouldn't say these things and would be happy that her and her family have a good life now. She ended the session and we didn't play it again after that night. I was sort of left confused, but eventually I just kind of blew it off. Three months later, I was getting ready for school and about to jump in the shower and saw something shine out of the corner of my eye. Upon close inspection, I realized that... It was actually a, a small camera. Long story short, my stepdad had put cameras around the house and had been recording me showering, changing clothes, and even sleeping. I slept in the nude at the time with my door locked. I discovered it and we found out that he'd been doing this for almost six months. He had the idea even longer than that and he was exchanging them with people online for other videos. He was arrested and spent a good while in prison, but never, never would I ever had seen this coming. It was completely out of what we thought was his character, and we were absolutely destroyed as a family because of this. A few weeks after he was sent away, I was in my mum's room, and she just sort of said, Ronnie was right. It freaked me out so much, because honestly, I just really can't explain this. No one, and I really mean that no one, had any idea that this was happening. He truly was very, very sneaky about it. But somehow, Ronnie, he knew. So I was around the age of 13, and I was staying at my friend's house for New Year's Eve. She lived out on a farm, so there weren't many houses around where she lived. We were sat on her bed talking and I happened to notice a dog running into the darkness outside. He was barking but I thought that he must have been barking at a fox or something. I didn't think anything of it to be honest until maybe a few minutes later when I see him in my view again. But this time he's growling and I saw what he was growling at because there was a woman trying to hit and kick him. I told my friend that there was someone outside and she thought that I was joking my friend turned around and realized that there actually was a woman out there. She ran out to her dad and told him about her. He ran to his room and came out with a shotgun. It's safe to say that me and my friend were scared. He didn't even seem like the type of man to own a gun. Her mum had heard the commotion and they both went outside to the woman. Keep in mind, this was all well past midnight in the country, so very scary to see a random woman just outside attacking the dog. My friend's mum invited the woman inside because she seemed really distressed. She offered her a glass of water and she said that she would call the police. The woman though was telling us not to call the cops and that her boyfriend was actually down the road and that they had gotten into an argument and apparently it had gotten physical and she would be fine. Brian grabbed his car keys and said that he would be back and he was just going to see if the boyfriend was still there. The woman told him that she would come but he said no. And this, this is the scary part. So as he was driving down the road, he saw a car and he was driving up to it. His headlights shone in the bushes and there was a man stood there trying to hide. Brian quickly turned around and drove back to the house. He told her that he was going to call the police and that she needed to stay inside until they arrived. At first he thought that she was a victim and felt sorry for the woman. But she ended up getting up and saying that she was fine and leaving, even though my friend's mum was trying to get her to stay put and wait for the cops. They came out and took a statement, and they told Brian that 
There have been a lot of car thefts lately in this manor where someone knocks late at night and gets the homeowner to help, but when he had stopped and gotten out near the car, then he would have had it stolen. The cops did search around the area for the couple, but they didn't find them. At 13 years old, this was a, such a scary experience, and just really unexpected as well. We still bring it up to each other, even now that we're in our 20s, and it's really just amazed us that there are people out there with such malicious intent. So, um, I've never really shared this with anyone, other than with my girlfriend, of course, until now, because although I have belief in paranormal events to a, a certain extent, I suppose, aliens, ghosts, certain legendary creatures, etc., I'm not the type that just believes every story to be true or want people to think that I've lost my mind. Anyway... It was early summer, 2010, and I only remember this because my 21st birthday had just passed and was finally legal to hit the bars. It was a Friday night and I was up having a drink at a bar that my cousin David was the bartender at. It was a small town bar that, outside of an event like a band or other entertainment was there, it usually stayed pretty quiet. It was very early in the evening as well and I had just gotten off work for the night working at a McDonald's in another small town less than 10 miles from the small town that I lived in. So, I was on only my second drink of the evening when my phone rang. On the other end was a friend of mine from childhood, James. He was calling, just asking if I wanted to come over to his brother's house and join them for a night of poker, beer and weed. Sounded like a good time in my book, and since I was literally only one sip into my second gin and tonic, I agreed to make the drive into Toledo. Most people know where that is, but for those of you who don't, it's a city in the northwest region of Ohio, about an hour or so south of Detroit. It was about a 20 minute drive from my small town and figured that it would be a good time. So I stopped at home to grab some cash. I only took 10 or 20 bucks with me to the bar to make sure if I ever got caught up having a good time drinking that I didn't screw up, and to have too good of a time and end up closing down the bar that evening. So I left my house at 11.05pm. I remember that distinctly as well because I had called James to tell him that I was on my way as they were going to wait for me and start the poker game at 11.30. We always played a tournament style of poker game where we all put our money in at once, got equal amount of chips, and played until there was only one person left with any chips left, who then got to keep all of the money. Anyway, I took my usual route over to his brother Eddie's house as I've done so many times before. We had all gotten together, a group of anywhere from like four to six of us, and would play poker in Eddie's basement at least twice a month, usually more. I just got into the corner of Oakdale Street and East Broadway. I was sitting in a red light with an area that's really nothing but residential housing, outside of the elementary school that sat at that exact corner. I'm sitting up, looking at the red light, just waiting for it to change, which always seemed to take absolutely forever coming from that direction when I noticed something in the sky that, from my vantage point, was partially hidden directly behind the red light. It was a, a very bright white light that seemed to be pointing straight down, almost like it was a, a helicopter, maybe using a spotlight to identify something, but much, much brighter at the point of the origin. Also, I heard absolutely nothing after rolling my windows down, and knew that this could not possibly be a helicopter or... I would absolutely be able to hear it. Wanting a better view, I pulled into the parking lot of an ice cream shop that sat directly across the road from the school that I was nearby, and got out of my car to try and figure out what this thing was. But when I got out of the car, I stared up into the sky, and I immediately found it again. It couldn't have been a plane as well, because it just didn't have the right shape. It was more uh, an oval than anything. Most stories you hear like this say it's circular but it was definitely an oval shape, this one. I almost thought perhaps it was a blimp, given the shape that is, but it seemed far too large to be a blimp, even by the measurements that everyone knows, like the Goodyear blimp. Plus, it had no decals or identifying marks or anything. It was just all silver or greyish. But after what felt to me about 30 seconds or so of looking at this thing, my eyes just started to burn, 
Not burn in the sense of extreme burning or anything like that, but almost like the feeling of when a, a bug flies into your eyes and causes them to water up. So I closed my eyes and I began to rub them. My eyes are closed at this point, so obviously it's all black. After finally getting my eyes to stop bothering me, I try to look up again and find it's just gone. I looked around but couldn't see it anymore. This is a very densely populated neighborhood with houses and trees and stuff like that, able to obscure any view of things that you'd look up in the sky to see. So, after a little less than a minute, I just decided, oh well, time to go and play poker. So I get over to Eddie's house, which is about four blocks from where this had taken place, and I knock on the basement door. A few moments go by, and nobody answers, so I decide to go to the front door and knock. I figured that maybe since I'm probably like 5 or 10 minutes early, maybe they're upstairs playing on the PlayStation 3 or something. So I knock on the door, but still no answer. Finally, I start knocking very loudly on the door, almost pounding, and Eddie finally answers the door and says, Man, why are you knocking on my door this late? I look at him, honestly confused, and I said, well, uh, your brother said to come over and come play cards with you guys. He stares at me for what felt like an eternity and finally responds. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, I know he did, but he called you like five or six hours ago. It's 4.30 in the morning. How late did you think we would be playing? This really scared me quite a bit. As from what I had remembered, this moment... There's just no way it could be later than, like, at least 11.25, 11.30 at the most. I attempted to play it off and be cool and say, Damn, man, I must have lost track of time. Can I use your bathroom before I head back home? He agrees and tells me that I should splash some water on my face as I look like I'm either drunk or haven't slept in a week. I walk into his bathroom and I look in the mirror and my eyes are absolutely bloodshot and it almost looks like I have two black eyes. To this day I have absolutely no idea what happened to me that night. I honestly have no explanation for the lost hours worth of time, how I could not have possibly noticed that much time being passed or how on earth something that felt like my eyes being irritated by a mosquito or something similar flying into my eyes resulted in me having these huge two black eyes. I don't want to pretend to know what it was and explain it or even assume that whatever it was that I saw that evening had anything to do with it, but it has creeped me out ever since. So I just got off work. Today I worked from 7am to 1pm and around 10.45 uh, I would say, a man walks in. I've had previous odd encounters with this man, such as seeing him walk behind me around my neighborhood and him hanging around out near my street and whatnot. I had brushed those off since I live right next to where I work and figured that he lived there also, but always just sort of kept an eye on him. Anyway, the man comes in and orders his usual pastry. I work at a bakery and he tells me, yeah, um, I'm going to stay inside and eat my pastry. For anyone who doesn't know, my country is currently under lockdown because of the coronavirus and all dining indoors is strictly prohibited. Not to mention that my bakery is tiny and there have never been any tables to sit inside. Only a coffee bar that has never had space to sit at. So I tell him, Oh, uh, well, we're actually in lockdown so you can't really eat inside. And his response chills me. He says, Are you alone here? Uh, yeah, I respond stupidly, but quickly try to catch myself. But my co-worker will be here soon. A complete lie. It's only about 11am and my co-worker isn't scheduled till 1pm when I'm off. Then no one will see me in here. He responds and goes back to eating his pastry at the coffee counter. I roll my eyes and I go back to work. I'm not getting paid enough to care if he quickly eats his pastry and leaves. 10 minutes pass, then 15. This guy is still in my bakery. I look over and he's finished his pastry and has moved closer to the open space in the counter meant for the employees to walk back and forth between the front of the store and to the employee's only side. And now I'm starting to get a bit uncomfortable. I quickly text my co-worker, 
who's a 30 year old man who owns a lot of guns and treats me like a little sister, 911. I look over again and now the man is even closer and is also reading a book. He's putting the book in front of his face and peeking at me from above it, just sort of watching me. Every time I turn back to him, he gets closer and closer and closer again, until eventually he's halfway in our employee-only area. I begin frantically texting my co-worker. He tells me that he's only four minutes away. I finally make the decision to text my boyfriend. I had avoided doing so to keep from scaring him, but now I was terrified. I sat in the back of the employee area watching this guy. I held a knife just in case he decided to come any closer. And just as he takes a step closer, my co-worker busts through the door. A confrontation ensues and the man leaves the shop, but continues to sit in his parked car right out front and just sort of stares at me. I tell my co-worker about the previous experiences that I've had with him and at this point, he's had enough. He marches out to the guy's car and tells him that next time he comes around, it'll be his last. My boyfriend pulls up at this point and also joins in with the warnings. I haven't seen this guy since then, but I'm definitely keeping a lookout.